Welcome everyone to the Coin Brief Podcast. This is episode five of the podcast. Um, I'm Sean Wentz. And I'm Evan Fagger. And uh, every week we talk about the latest news and developments in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency space. Um, so this is the week of uh, June 26th. Um, we are on the cusp of the U.S. Marshals holding their auction of 26,000 Bitcoins. Um, that is going to happen tomorrow and they'll release the results of that auction on Monday. And, um, so let's, let's just start with that and, uh, kind of delve into that topic a little bit. Um, Evan, do you think that the auction, uh, happening this weekend will have an immediate effect on the price? And, uh, and what's, what's your latest, uh, price analysis based on the evidence that we have so far? I think it's already having an effect on the price. Um, today... It start the price started out today or at five sixty, and um, you know a couple of days ago it went from it went from five ninety down to five sixty, and um, I said that was going to happen in an article I wrote recently because there was going to be panic selling leading up to the auction, and that would create a slight deviation from the sideways trend that we've been experiencing. Experiencing, but it's back in the five hundred eighty range. Uh, the day before the auction, so that tells me that people are getting excited over it. So, I think it's definitely already having an immediate effect on the price. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but after the coins have already been auctioned off and we get the results on Monday, as long as the winners hold the coins, there's not going to be any. Um, there won't be any downward pressure on the price. Uh, the yeah. only thing that could happen is that the price. Uh, the sideways trend will remain, uh, will persist until something else happens to uh, either increase or decrease the price. Um, or it'll go up a little bit because people will be an, uh, anticipating good news. Like, um, like for instance, let's assume that second market wins at least some of the coins and they invest that into their business. Um, people would be anticipating good things to come from that, so they might buy a little bit more so mm. they could then you know participate in in second market mm. so um, i definitely don't think that uh it's going to drive the price down unless one unless somebody decides to dump them all then you know it will but yeah. um yeah 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 but it's, it all depends on uh how what they do with the coins and i'm I'm pretty confident that whoever wins, they're going to hold them as an investment. And so then it depends on how long uh, they hold them. Yeah. Because yeah. because the longer they hold them, the more coins are mined, right? So um, as the supply grows larger and larger, um, the coins that those auction winners are holding will have less an effect, of an effect on the price when they're dumped. So that's what I think is going to happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and we discussed this a little bit last week as well. Like, um, we wouldn't really expect um, bidders to try and buy the coins just to dump them on the market. That wouldn't really make sense. It's not really efficient for people, for people to do that. It seemed, I, I looked at that list um, a little bit more, and I think that the bidders um, fall into two main categories. You've got the people who are uh, involved with Bitcoin businesses, and they're buying up the coins to possibly uh, bolster the funds for their business and such. A second market is the main example of that. They, they actually want the coins because they're involved in the industry. Then there's others um, like, you know, the random artists and lawyers who don't necessarily work in the Bitcoin industry. Um, you know, they're probably just looking for a good deal on coins. They're a fan of Bitcoin. They like it a lot and they've got the money to, to spare and um, they don't really want to go on an exchange and spend a whole ton of money on an exchange for bitcoins and, and pay, you know, basically the exchange rate. They're hoping to get a good deal from the U.S. Marshall's auction. So, yeah, like uh, there's no reason to, success, to suspect that uh, anyone's going to buy the coins and then just dump them on the auction or dump them on the markets. So... I think that if we do see um, a downward trend in the price this week, it'll be because of speculators. It's it won't necessarily be because directly because of the auction, 
because it's just not likely to happen. Um, if if the price goes down, it'll be the speculators who who think that the coins might get dumped on the market. And as right. as everyone knows in the Bitcoin space, speculators do have um, a lot of influence in the markets. Right, and we've already seen a little bit of that. Um, and just to go back to what you said about the uh, the two main groups, the individuals versus the Bitcoin companies, um, I think those individuals they're banking on getting the coins at below market price, you know. And so if they do get them below market price, uh, then it's very possible that they could dump them because you know mm. they would pay below market price and then mm. they make a profit just by having they want them. Want a profit? You know? Yeah. Um, but I don't think that's going to happen, though, because because um, their competition are these, you know, pretty substantially large Bitcoin companies who and they and they want the coins because they're expecting, you know, a few years from now, they're they're expecting the price to be at like a million dollars for Bitcoin, yeah. you know, so they're they're going to be willing to bid way above the market price. So. Um, so, yeah, I think it's going to be a company that's going to get the Bitcoins and I think they're going to hold them. So, okay, um, p the idea of people bidding above the market price. Um, my question is why, like, if, if someone is willing to pay above the market price, price for a bulk order of, you know, thousands of Bitcoins, um, you know, like, why, why wouldn't they just go on an exchange or go on Coinbase or whatever and buy in bulk at the current exchange rate? You know, like, why... Uh, why why willingly pay a premium to the U.S. Marshals for the Silk Road coins? Well, it's because um, they're looking ahead, you know, like five or ten years from now. You know, they the Bitcoin price right now is five eighty four. If they, you know, if if somebody were to buy those coins right now for like a thousand dollars, yeah, they've taken a pretty substantial loss right now, but they did that because they're expecting the price to be like ten thousand mm -hmm, dollars mm -hmm. you know so yeah so like a thousand so like f you know like five hundred dollars above the current market price is a small price to pay uh when you're expecting it to um to increase by like you know like a thousand percent right but like why 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 wouldn't they just go on to coinbase or local bitcoins or you know any of these so many sources where you can buy bitcoins these days and just pay um at the exchange rate or just above the exchange rate you know if that's their motivating factor like okay the price of a bitcoin is gonna multiply a thousand fold like that's the sentiment of a lot of people in the community i just don't think that um that's a, enough of a motivating factor to to get some of these bidders to be willing to pay above market price for the Silk Road Bitcoins. I think that it's mainly people uh, looking for a deal on bulk Bitcoins. But um, going back to something you said earlier um, about people wanting to make a make a profit if they do get a good deal. Yeah, actually that now that I think about it, that is a that is a real possibility. Because, you know, these people who do like the idea of Bitcoin and, and they're into it, like they could still want to make a profit, and if they get a good deal, then, um, like, let's say, let's say, let's say they get, like, a three thousand bitcoins in in one block, right, in the auction. Let's say they get those at around four hundred dollars per coin. They get a pretty pretty damn good deal at the current market price, and uh, and yeah, I could I could I, I could see them uh, dumping at least a fraction of those onto exchanges. And uh, tr you know, trying to recoup some of their cash, and then just keep the majority of the of their winnings for themselves, personal use or whatever. So, um, with with that in mind, yeah, you know what? I I think that we might see a little bit of um, of a little bit of downward pressure. But again, it's mainly the speculators who are gonna who are gonna drive that. I think. Well, um, I also think that a reason uh, why they might be willing to pay above market price, uh, one is because I think, yeah, they're auctioning them off in blocks of 3,000, but I think realistically the people competing for these are going for all of them. 
You know, they're mm. going for all, how many are there, 30,000 coins or something like that? Yeah, almost 30,000. Yeah, th yeah, I think I, th I think they're going for for all of them. And um, and also they, they might not want to... Um, they might not want to manipulate the ex the exchange prices, because you know if they buy it on an exchange, it's gonna it's gonna skyrocket, and then it's gonna create a lot of speculation that they're getting ready to dump, because you know like somebody just bought thirty thousand coins on an exchange, and now you know the price went up a thousand percent, so now they're probably gonna dump it, and everything's mm -hmm. gonna mm -hmm. die, and so then everybody would dump their coins. Maybe they're anticipating that, and so they want to buy something. Um, they want to buy you know. 30,000 coins. Uh, you can't do that with local Bitcoins because you know, you know how many people are holding $17 million worth of Bitcoins. Yeah, not going to happen. And, um, so, th you know, they might... It's it's possible that they just don't want to do it on an exchange. And um, I think... I mean, it's possible... I I'm sure they're hoping for, you know, below market price. But... Um, Judging by the fact that you have to pay two hundred thousand dollars just to get in the door, and yeah, then uh, yeah. and then the sheer and then the sh you know the sheer size of the companies you know relative to the Bitcoin economy, of course, um, you know they're pretty they're pretty large and pretty wealthy in terms of uh, the Bitcoin economy. So yeah. I don't see why they wouldn't be willing to bid above market price, especially with the competition. You know, they're they're all wanting to beat each other out, so they're all going to have to bid higher than each other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, we'll we'll see how all this plays out. This is all going to happen this weekend. Um, uh, viewers, you guys will probably be watching this uh, as the auction is happening or as it's finishing. So um, you know, go ahead. Uh, uh, Write in the comments uh, your your opinions and and what you think about what's happening with the auctions. Go ahead, join join the discussion. Um, so we'll 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 talk more about this next week and about the actual results that come out on Monday. So uh, let's move on to another topic. Uh, uh, you've you've written a few articles this week, Evan, about uh, some governments that uh, are uh, considering regulations of Bitcoin. Um, Canada, for instance, has decided to regulate Bitcoin, um, while other countries have decided not to. Can you uh, expand on on uh, what Canada is going to do about regulations? Yeah, this uh, this week there's been a lot of regulation talk this week from you know Canada, Canada, Japan, uh, Switzerland. And I didn't write an art. I didn't get a chance to write an article about this, but um, but Sweden, the Swedish, uh, not the, not the, uh, yeah, the yeah, Swedish uh, central bank released a report on Bitcoin, and uh, they they said that Bitcoin was really important, but it wasn't, uh, the, you know, the the Bitcoin economy wasn't big enough to have any uh, immediate significant impact on. On their on the mainstream economy, so that they they aren't really worried about regulating it. Hmm, okay. Didn't get a chance to write an article about that, but Canada. You asked me about Canada. Um, yeah. They. They're not. Uh, they're not writing legislation uh, specifically dedicated to Bitcoin. They've just passed an amendment to an existing law. Uh, it's the Proceeds of Crime, and Terrorist Financing Act of two thousand. Okay. And um, they've Almost amended like the that. Patriot Act from America. <laughs> they've they've amended that to um, to include Bitcoin along with all the other cryptocurrencies and virtual currency in general. Okay. Um, and basically, what it is is that um, the people, P Bitcoin companies like um, you know, like exchanges like Coinbase, Bitstamp, or or RoboCoin, you know, um, mm -hmm. if if your business is uh, dealing in the buying and selling of Bitcoin, you know, you're you're not like you're not like a good seller manufacturer. You're you're a financial institution, you know. If you're one of these businesses, you have to now be compliant with um, with Canadian financial regulations. Okay, so. Okay. So, so it's kind of like they're they're just updating their finance laws 
to include Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and stuff. Yeah. Kind of the same way that America, uh, we had those Senate hearings back in November where the senators wanted to make sure that, you know, uh, if Bitcoin's fine, you know, uh, we don't need to regulate it necessarily. We don't need to uh, really write any new laws or anything. But um, we just want to make sure that the people who are operating in this space are obeying and complying with all these anti-money laundering laws and know your customer laws and stuff like that. So is that basically what Canada's trying to do in their country? Yeah, the the Bitcoin companies they're gonna have to um, they're gonna have to register with uh, I can't remember the name of it. It's some bureau, you know, like financial bureau to prevent you know uh, financial crime and things like that. Yeah. And, um, you know, there will be, like, a licensure, registration, things like that. And so, um, and really, uh, you know, the market price reflected this. You know, really, this, uh, this amendment to the legislation is not that important because um, the companies, you know, the companies that this would affect, they've already ran into this problem in, in – um, in other countries that have similar legislation. So, you know, they're already working to be compliant with these laws. They're used to so it. So it's not really going to have a huge impact. But um, it is pretty significant because we do have a country that's uh, trying to, you know, regulate Bitcoin. Uh-huh. It, and it also kind of reminds me of um, what California has been trying to do in their state government lately. Uh, they just... The legislature just passed um, a bill that would basically declare... Bitcoin and other digital currencies as lawful money, um, meaning it's not illegal. They just want to clarify that it's not illegal because there used to be a certain institute in the Corporations Code of California um, that basically said that no one's allowed to create their own, their own currency. Mm -hmm. So uh, the legislators, you know, in California, they love the fact that. Uh, it's the state of technology and, and a lot of, um, it drives their economy basically. So the, le the politicians want to make sure that they be seen as uh, friendly to digital currency and the whole Bitcoin, um, industry. So that's why they're kind of trying to make sure that like the law seems friendly towards it. And they're, they're, it's, it's not even really a new law they wrote. They just basically passed, um, uh, it's it's kind of like amending the corporation's code. They just struck out that one line that kind of makes it seem like Bitcoin might be illegal. So um, it's pretty interesting to see different governments' uh, takes on this issue and how they're all kind kind of trying to approach it with different um, different mindsets and different approaches to it. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely um I definitely respect the Canadian uh, government for. Because, you know, they're, they're trying to legitimize Bitcoin. You know, they want people to use it. Um, so, you know, I, I give them respect for that. But at the same time, this regulation, it's just um, overall, I, th I think it's negative for for the Bitcoin economy. Really? Because um, the all these, you know, registration requirements and things like that, it's just going to make it so expensive uh, yeah. to register yeah. your your company so um, really all this is doing is it's uh, restricting future competition so you know now uh, you know like five years from now it, it, the only the only two exchanges that might be able to uh, do any business at all in Canada might be bitstamp and coinbase because you know those are the two biggest ones right yeah, yeah. There are two of and, the biggest ones. And Coinbase is in San Francisco, so like that's that's um what what is what does Canada actually have in terms of exchanges? Oh, well, um well, I don't know if Canada has any like uh exchanges based out of Canada, but this um but this amendment it applies to any business uh doing any kind of activity in Canada. So it doesn't matter where you're based out of. Like if if somebody lives in Canada and buys and buys Bitcoin uh, from Coinbase or sells on Coinbase, uh, then technically Coinbase is doing business in Canada, so they have wow. to be compliant with Canadian financial law. Wow, that is totally yeah. insane. Yeah, it's really weird, um, but apparently, you know, this it's happening in a lot of other places. 
I mean, yeah, how do they how do they expect people to to comply with that? That's ridiculous. I mean, in the age of the internet, um, you you can't restrict people like that from 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 doing business with with companies in other countries. You know, especially an, a fellow neighboring country that speaks the same language as you. Like yeah, exactly. It's 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 unnecessarily restrictive. It yeah, sounds like. like um, you know, like. Like Coinbase and Bitstamp, you know, they're going to be able to do it because they got really rich before it was regulated. But, mm. you know, five mm. five years from now, you know, when Coinbase, you know, has a monopoly on the Canadian exchange uh, market, um, there won't be any newcomers who'll be able to afford to do this because, you know, they're going to have minimum starting capital, obviously, yeah. being a startup. <clears throat> and they're going to have to spend all this time and money on uh, becoming compliant with the regulations. So, um, really it's kind of dangerous because, you know, you, you're, you're manipulating the law so that, and it's an unintentional consequence, of course, but you're restricting competition. What happens if the only exchanges who can afford to be compliant with these laws, what happens if they become the, ne the next Mt. Gox? You know, yeah. That's gonna be some pretty big trouble. That like that'll be pretty bad news if that happens. Yeah. That would make that would make not not only the part of the Bitcoin industry look bad again with negative press, the whole Mt. Gox fiasco all over again, but it would look make the government look bad too because like these are supposed to be the businesses that are regulated and are, are complying with the laws mm. and everything. These were the government approved. Businesses. Yeah, government approved, like stamp approval from the politicians, and then if it fails anyway, which it can, because regulations aren't perfect and are often too crippling, then um, it'll it'll make the government look pretty stupid for having not been able to prevent that. Right, and this this is what I think about Mount Gox. Uh, you know, the Mount Gox crash happened uh, while you know this and and. In the era before governments, you know, even really considered Bitcoin as you know a substantial threat, so there was you know very minimal regulation. So there, you know, so there's like a million other exchanges. Yeah. So when Mount, so when Mount Gox crashed, you know, it, you know, if people were able to get their funds from Mount Gox, you know, I know like a lot of people lost everything. Um, but one, if you were able to get your funds out of Mount Gox, you could have put them in another exchange, and two. Um, there wasn't really, there was a lot of fear. Obviously, the price dropped by uh, went from like a thousand to what was it, like three hundred dollars oh. or something. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think at but, one point on Mount Gox itself, it, it said like a hundred and thirty or something really low like that yeah. when it was re died but, right um, away. But you know, it, it, the people, the the people in the Bitcoin community weren't completely hopeless. Because they had all these alternatives. Yeah. You know, so I so I, I think that if Mt. Gox was the only exchange and it crashed, Bitcoin would be dead right now. Mm. That's what mm. that's what um, the governments who are enacting these kind of uh, regulations, that's what they're setting the Bitcoin economy up for in the future. Because huh. huh. um, there's only going to be a handful of exchanges who can, who can afford uh, to do this. Um, who can afford to be compliant? So if one crashes, uh, it's going to have a really nasty effect on uh, the confidence of Bitcoin, which of course has an effect on its value. Yeah, um, that's an effect of uh, centralization, right? Basically, having centralized um, infrastructure. If you only have a couple of exchanges, um, because of uh, crippling regulations that are put in place by the government, and uh, like that would basically serve to make the infrastructure itself more centralized. If there's a couple points of failure in the entire system, and if those get knocked out, if another Mt. Gox happens again, ne I mean, negligent management or whatever it is, thievery, whatever, uh, then take out that one point of failure and boom. You, you it, 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 like, I wouldn't say it would kill Bitcoin because... Bitcoin itself will still exist. The network will still still exist. It'll just be really a lot harder to trade them and such. We'll be back into the dark ages, basically. Like, you know, mm -hmm. back four years ago, in Bitcoin's history. So, like, it it would just it would just hurt it. It would seriously set it back. 
um, you know, a couple years and we would have to build back up again. So yeah, I think that like, yeah, we're, we're getting to a point where people in the community, if they really care about seeing this experiment succeed, um, we need to fight centralization on all fronts and this government regulation stuff, uh, some of it is harmless, but then other examples can actually serve to centralize Bitcoin more. And we need to be wary of that. I mean, I don't live in Canada, so I can't, you know, really, uh, I can't even really affect the politicians there. But, you know, the people living in Canada, you got you to gotta speak up. Make sure your politicians are representing you. Make sure they don't ruin Bitcoin uh, for your country. Yeah, and so yeah, that's that. Those are the long-term uh, effects that the centralization will have um, on Bitcoin. But right now, you know, this Canadian legislation had no effect on the price. Um, and uh, the other two stories, Japan and uh, and Switzerland, they both decided to not regulate okay. Bitcoin. For the um, for the same reason, or did they did they reach that for uh, based on different evidence? Uh, Switzerland said that there's no need to make new legislation because any Bitcoin business um, already falls under standing financial law. Uh, because okay. I think Switzerland treats it as a currency, um, you know, a, a currency equal in quality to you know fiat currency. So huh. they're saying, look, it's money. Um, so it's already it's already covered by our financial laws. Okay. Japan, they I have to look right quick because I wrote it almost a week ago. Now, I mean, Japan. That's that's um, a big deal because obviously that's where Mount Gox was headquartered. Yeah, that's where Mount Gox is. So, common sense would um, suggest that Japan would want to regulate Bitcoin because the most high-profile failure of any Bitcoin-related business happened there in Japan, and tons of people around the world lost money in that situation. So it's kind of it's interesting that Japan decided not to regulate it. You know, is that because they think they can handle all of the issues with the current um, financial laws that they have in place? Yeah, um, well, I'm looking at the article I wrote, and um, from what I can tell from my article, another report might have something different. Um, they didn't really state a reason. Um, basically what happened was um, a representative from the Liberal Democratic Party, which is the dominating political party in Japan, just announced that um, they've they've been you know mulling it over trying to decide if they want to regulate or not and you know the, and this representative from the LDP came out the other day and he said uh, quote unquote basically we concluded that we will for now avoid a move towards legal regulation and uh, from what I found that's pretty much all they said oh okay um, that's pretty still that's still vague then though. Yeah, you know, they could still regulate soon if they wanted. Yeah, to. but for but for now it's going to remain unregulated, and um, it could be for the same reasons. Maybe they're maybe they're getting ready to say that. Well, you know, it's it's money, so it it's already covered by our financial rules. Yeah. Um. But maybe also they just don't. I don't know why they would think this because Mount Gox is such a huge deal. But maybe they just think that Bitcoin really isn't important enough to warrant. Uh, regulation. Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, like, I can see regulation actually having um, a positive impact on. Um, well, re what 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 regulation is supposed to do, ideally, is prevent bad people from, you know, screwing you over. Uh, like Mark Carpelis, you know, this guy either through negligence or through, you know, backhanded thievery, um, everyone's coins vanished from Mt. Gox, and now he's going through court proceedings to uh, try and declare bankruptcy for Mt. Gox and everything. Now, if the government actually wanted to put smart regulations in place, they would put something in place where they could possibly um, hire, like, forensic investigators 
to analyze the, the blockchain and try and figure out exactly where the Dox coins went. Um, now, we already have some people trying to do that online on 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 Reddit and such, trying to do you know uh, armchair investigations into the blockchain. But you know, imagine imagine um, a, a government like Japan actually investing some hard money into trying to analyze the blockchain. All the information is there that you need, and investing enough to analyze it and figure out exactly what Mark Carpolis did with those coins. Now that, that would be some really interesting uh, regulation that could really help uh, the the case, you know? Well, that's an interesting point because I think that that's a pretty good example of how um, governments, they can, you know, they can never, they can never act proactively you know that they, yeah, they always yeah. they always are reactive um they respond to things after they happen and uh so yeah like they could try to figure out what mark carpal is did um but if they try to employ that same methodology to prov to prevent crime then you get into you know privacy violation things and like and, mm -hmm. and, and things like that um and that's a whole another can but, of worms right there so, and, and to to prevent things like this, the government really can't do anything. Uh, so what they do is they just, um, and plus, you know, they're, they're a monopoly. The governments don't have any competition. So they're, they're only worried about uh, getting votes instead mm -hmm. of like, you know, actually solving a problem. Mm -hmm. so, what, so what they do is they, um, so they just remove any risk. You know, like we, re we recognize Bitcoin is very dangerous, so we're going to have this... Um, we're going to have this government backed insurance fund where if you lose anything on an exchange, we're going to refund you. You know, so um, they basically, pretty much all they can do is remove personal responsibility, which makes things mm. worse. And um, and they would do that because that would get them more votes from the population yeah, yeah. who don't want to think yeah. for oh, themselves. Hey, the, gov the government cares about us. They're going to give me money if I lose my, if I make a bad choice on yeah. the Bitcoin exchange. So I'm going to vote for them. But you know, really, the only way the problem is going to get solved is um, competing exchanges trying to uh, satisfy their customers and make them feel safe. Um, and so they're going to do things proactively and solve problems before they happen, uh, which is something that is unique to the private sector. The government can never do that because they don't have that kind of foresight. Um, mm. Because they, because they only they only re react to things after they happen because they respond to the reactions of people, right? Private yeah. sector companies, they, they're they able to solve problems before they happen because their job is to, uh, is to create things that people want before they even know that they want them, right? That's how entrepreneurs make profit. Yeah. So, so their goal is not to respond to the reactions of people, is to make sure that the people don't have these negative reactions to begin with. Yeah. And, and that's just something that the government has no interest in doing. D damn. I mean, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's unfortunate. You know, I, I think uh, a lot of people um, kind of go about society with the assumption that the government has their back or at least has the intention of having their back, you know, and that, that it will protect them. But, um, it's a, it's a, it's a bloated bureaucracy. I can't speak about Japan specifically, but I know here in America, it's ridiculous. The bureaucracy is insane. And yeah, it's, um, it's, it's hard. It's, it's, it's hard for those agencies to have foresight when all they do is react to problems that that have happened in the past so yeah it's maybe maybe decentralized um infrastructure will eventually help make governments more efficient that's uh or irrelevant or or irrelevant <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that'll uh that'll that'll probably happen they probably won't like that though they don't they won't no, like feeling irrelevant they'll fight that definitely yeah all right. Um, so that's enough for uh, governments right now. Um, let's let's move on to something else. Uh, uh, so 
Overstock, uh, Patrick Byrne, CEO of Overstock.com, which does accept Bitcoin payments for products. Uh, Patrick Byrne made an announcement at uh, the Bitcoin in the Beltway conference in Washington, D.C., and said that uh, he will be donating 3% of the Bitcoin profits he gets in revenue. Uh, he'll be donating 3% to uh, spreading Bitcoin adoption and awareness throughout society. So uh, do you think that's a pretty pretty positive development from Overstock? Yeah, I think that's a really great thing for Overstock to do, um, especially because they make a pretty good bit of profit on Bitcoin. Uh -huh. um, they started accepting Bitcoin at the beginning of 2014, and um, by March, they made 1.6 million uh, in Bitcoin. And um, dang, that's just in the company Bitcoin revenue. Themselves, they're yeah, just in Bitcoin. Um, and and Overstock themselves have projected that they're that by the end of 2014, they're going to make 10 million in Bitcoin. Very nice. Um, but. Uh, but when I posted this article on Reddit, there was uh, people, of course, who said it was a terrible idea and it wouldn't help at all. But they actually did make a they actually did make a pretty good point. Um, and I don't, because this is because um, this is what Overstock says. Overstock says uh -huh. they're going to make ten million by the end of twenty fourteen. Um, but I don't know of any reports that have came out on their Bitcoin profits since March. So they, you know, their their Bitcoin sales could be slowing down, um, yeah. and there's, you know, there's a chance that they might not meet, make anywhere near ten million. Um, yeah. But if they do make if they do make ten million ten million dollars in Bitcoin by the end of twenty fourteen, that's going to be three hundred thousand dollars that they donate to uh, Bitcoin awareness groups. So that's a pretty substantial amount of money, mm. and I think these advocacy groups. Are going to be able to do a lot with it, and uh, and if if they if the price hits the moon between now and the, and end, the end of, of 2014, 2014, yeah, you know that three percent that three percent is going to be worth a lot more, right? Yeah. So um, so even even if the numbers aren't significant, um, at least the at least the idea, at least it was a good idea, you know. It is a good idea, and. Yeah. Uh, and it shows it shows really good intentions. You know, Patrick Byrne really cares about Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, you know, he's do, he's doing this in addition to uh, keeping ten percent of Bitcoin profits instead of converting them to dollars. Yeah, he holds it. He actually and, likes holding it. Yeah, yeah. He he owns several million dollars worth of Bitcoin himself in his personal accounts, funds, and also he said that he was going to be expanding um, Bitcoin acceptance to uh, the international market. Uh, so I didn't know this, but right now it's only uh, you can only use Bitcoin uh, with Overstock if you're in the U.S. Uh, but uh, Burns said that he's going to be expanding that uh, to his international customers. So that's you know it's really good news, even if the numbers end up being insignificant. Yeah, okay, so um, I've got a couple questions about this. Um, did he mention, like, what specific organizations he would be donating the 3% to, or did he just say, in general, like, I'm going to use it to spread adoption? Like, did he say that he's going to give it to the Bitcoin Foundation or any other specific group or something? He said he was going to give it to Bitcoin advocacy groups. So I'm assuming he's going to pick, you know, like two or three out and distribute the 3% uh, between those couple groups, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. So th that is a good idea. That's a very good idea. Um, it's debatable how much of an impact it'll have. And that's a, that's a fair argument to have about how much difference can it really make, especially it, it depends on who he gives the money to. Mm-hmm. Um, I hope not the Bitcoin Foundation. I really hate the Bitcoin Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's no, that's another can of worms right there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but you know, you know, Patrick Byrne, he seems like a cool dude. Uh, he's a pretty, pretty good um, CEO uh, to to have talking about Bitcoin and supporting it. 
And, um, you know, I totally, I totally support his plan. Uh, it's, I, I think, I think it would be best if, you know, he used that money to not only spread awareness and adoption and such, but actually fund programmers who work on the code itself and, you know, build this public good that we all benefit from and that we're all, um, you know, often literally invested in um because the problem is the the code itself is tragically underfunded and um uh you know this this is a this is a good segue into another topic that i wanted to talk about which is um, mike hearn who's the developer of bitcoin j and he also works on the core bitcoin code uh, uh through the bitcoin foundation um the the chief scientist at the Bitcoin Foundation is Gavin Andreessen. And uh, Mike Hearn said in a recent podcast uh, with Epicenter Bitcoin that the core Bitcoin code is tragically underfunded. And there's, there's really, there's no infrastructure in place to compensate um, the coders who actually put in all, you know, these, their time, their energy, their work into actually improving the core code, which, you know, according to Mike Hearn, quote, it's ground to a halt. Uh, the work on the core code is ground to a halt. And during a time like this, when we have, you know, theoretical 51% attacks uh, from mining pools that gain, you know, too much mining power, uh, and th as the community debates, you know, possible solutions to that uh, involving changes to the code, like who's actually going to do those changes you know we need we need people who who will actually work on the code itself like mike hearn said that the bitcoin foundation which is supposed to be this lobbying group who's super you know into spreading bitcoin adoption and, and everything they actually only pay 3 people to work on the bitcoin core code and one of those people is Gavin Andreessen, who's the chief scientist. And then two of the others, Mike Hearn said in the podcast that uh, they don't even really want to work on the code anymore because it's gotten too political. Uh, arguments break out between the programmers about what, uh, what changes should be made. And the arguments have gotten more heated in the past year, um, partially because of, of this, like, this um, toxic... Uh, um, like opinions circulating in the community about what needs to be done and, and flame wars happening and and it, it's it's kind of a bad situation uh at, at, in concerning the bitcoin um core code so yeah uh what, what do you what do you think i think it's definitely a problem especially with uh the mining centralization thing going on um because you know, while I think having decentralized mining pools is a pretty is a pretty solid solution, mm -hmm. the only way to you know to permanently make it impossible to have a fifty one percent attack um, is to fix it in the core code. And uh, you know, a lot of people are saying that's what we need to happen. Like we, we need to, you know, a lot of people are saying uh, the developers need to combine proof of work with proof of stake somehow mm -hmm. to make yes, it impossible yes. to for a 51% attack to happen and then we need to have a hard fork and you know you create a new blockchain and and uh and you know we'll pick that the the market will pick the better blockchain of course mm -hmm. um but that can't happen if there's no incentive to to do the coding because it you know bitcoin bitcoin core it's not just some fun weekend project anymore yeah. Um, anybody who takes on changing it is basically taking on a full time job. Uh, so they you're gonna have they're gonna have to devote all their time to it, and so they need to be paid because they're they're giving Absolutely. us a very valuable service, and at the same time they have to make a living. Yeah. Um, yeah. I like Mike Hearn's solution. He he wants uh, he he had this idea for crowdsourcing the funds for the Bitcoin development. Yes. And he said that the the decentralized crowdsourcing uh, platform, what is it called? Light, is it called Lighthouse? Lighthouse, yes. 
yeah, the lighthouse. Um, he said that that could be a good starting point to you know to kick off the the crowdsource funding campaign. And yeah. I think that's a really good idea because um because then uh, that makes it less political. Like you said, core development has become very political. That makes it less political and more market oriented because uh, whoever has the best idea, the people are going to give that developer or group of developers their money. Yep. Um, yeah, then it's pretty straightforward. You just do whatever the market tells you to do. Yeah. So I think that's a really great idea that Mike Hearn had. He also said, here's a quote from from the um, the quote from the podcast. He said that um, in addition to his idea for uh, crowdsourcing uh, the funding for Bitcoin Core, he said that uh, the companies have the funding, they've got their profits, they've got their venture venture capital. They need Bitcoin to work well, so my plan is to mostly get these companies to pledge. Mm. So he wants to recruit, you know, the big companies. Uh, he mentioned specifically BitPay and Coinbase. He wants them to pledge money to help uh, core development because it's in their self-interest. I think that's a good idea too. Um, yeah. Whether or not he'll be successful, you know, only time will tell. But I think. I think um, it's very important that he's successful because the core development is a very important thing to Bitcoin. Yeah, it's hugely important. I mean, this it's 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 the actual code of of this decentralized network that we all use and love. And I kind of wonder, like, why wasn't a system like this put in place much earlier? Like, this is the kind of thing that I thought or kind of hoped, assumed, whatever, that the Bitcoin Foundation would kind of implement on its own a long time ago. Uh, a, a way to um, fund programmers and coders who actually improve the protocol, which is uh, one of the main appeals for, for, uh, of Bitcoin, to me at least, is that you can, you can modify the code to make it better, improve on it, um, prevent attacks and such, but there's like we're barely getting around to this now of finding a way to fund and compensate people for their hard work on improving this public good. And that's exactly how Mike Hearn described it is it's a public good that a lot of people benefit from, but no one necessarily wants to uh, sacrifice their own money to uh, improve it. And Lighthouse is his attempt to rectify that. And you know what? I, I, I love what Mike Hearn is doing. I think um, he's identifying problems in the ecosystem that people like me, you know, thought that someone else would take care of a long time ago. But, uh, uh, you know, Mike Hearn, he's, he's getting around to it and, um, and actually improving things and making the system better. Yeah, you know, I, I really, I think that's what the Bitcoin Foundation set out to do, you know, when it was first established. Yeah. Was to raise was to raise Bitcoin awareness and to improve the technology, um, but you know then they got tied up in lobbying governments and you know hanging out with bureaucrats and stuff, and, and becoming um, bureaucrats themselves in a lot of yeah, ways. Yeah, I mean, you hang out with governments, you're gonna start acting like a government. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, they've Bitcoin Foundation has just become really bureaucratic, uh, really secretive. Um, mm -hmm. Like I read, like I read somewhere that they had, you know, they had a Bitcoin Foundation uh, sponsored convention, and um, you know they're they're very secretive with that. You know, they didn't let a lot of press in, um, and they had a bunch of secret meetings that weren't open to the people at the convention and things like that. Oh man! So Don't. we, uh, what are they doing? My opinion is that we definitely need to have an alternative to the Bitcoin Foundation. Um, really preferably a decentralized, non-bureaucratic thing like Lighthouse uh, that will help yeah. raise funding for the core development. Um, because really, politics and government is just not that important. You know, if you, can make, if you can make Bitcoin work and if you can make it valuable, people are going to use it whether it's illegal or not. Yeah. You know, yeah. like when it, like that happened when it, you know, when it first started. Like, um, no, but like hardly anybody knew about it. And, um, 
and if the and if any governments found out about it and they found out it was mainly being used on Silk Road to trade drugs, they probably would have banned it immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and the people on Silk Road knew that. But they didn't care. They still used Bitcoin because they believed in it. Yeah, and it provided a useful uh, service for them. So, I mean, that's the important thing. Um, you know, trying to get the, the government on our side and things like that, it just... It just uh, detracts from you know the progression of Bitcoin acceptance because um, we're never going to convince the government because the whole the whole the you know the founding principle of Bitcoin was to render central banking and and um, and fiat money and government government monopolization of the money supply and the issuance of money. Bitcoin is supposed to render all that irrelevant. Mm. So. Bitcoin goes it it directly contradicts the interests of the government so there's no reason in trying to get the government on our side because it's not going to work. Yeah. You know, we just need to focus on making Bitcoin work and that's what we need to do in my opinion. You think it's kind of like a waste of time, unnecessary. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean even, you know, with the story about, you know, Canada's, you know, new amendment to regulate it. Um, even if they are sympathetic to Bitcoin and they want to, you know, legitimize it, the regulations they place are going to have a, a, a negative impact anyways because it's going to do things like restrict competition and, you know, make it, it's going to turn it, it's going to turn the Bitcoin economy into the mainstream economy and we see how well that's doing now, right? Yeah. Um, so I just don't think government is really important in terms of making Bitcoin work because Bitcoin is right. designed to yeah. work without a government. Yeah, we don't need California telling uh, the citizens that it's lawful money or not. We're going to use it if we want it anyway. Um, exactly. So uh, um, let's move on to um, our last topic for uh, this podcast. Um, the uh, Redcoin uh, new social wallet that they released, uh, the Redcoin developers, um, have you have you gotten a chance to try this out at all? The Redcoin new social wallet. No, I don't. The only uh, I have a very small amount of Redcoin, which I got from Coinbrief, because you know their promotion from comment on commenting on articles, you get uh, five hundred per comment. Yeah, yeah. So I have like, and you get a certain amount for joining. So I have yeah. like two. I have two thousand from that. Uh, from having an account and responding to comments, uh, but other than that, I'm not invested in Redcoin at all. So I don't really. Um, I've read I read the article, the Coinbrief article on the the wallet, mm -hmm. um, but I don't really know enough about Redcoin. Yeah, um, to have an I, opinion on it. I I uh, I tried out the wallet and like Red Redcoin the. Um the appeal or the the pitch is that it's the it's the social currency it's the going to be the cryptocurrency that is built for social networks and it'll be seamless uh for you know transferring over twitter facebook and such and uh you know this new social wallet that they released um the oh it's called the red wallet actually um first of all the first thing i noticed when i installed this and started playing around with it is it's very clean it looks very nice. Um, everything's organized nicely. It's it doesn't look like um, a regular cryptocurrency wallet. It's nothing like the Bitcoin QT wallet or you know Dogecoin QT. All those. It's very nice, streamlined design, um, and you you have ways that you can look at announcements and news, uh, recent news right from within the wallet so you can you know check out latest latest developments of red coin and such and there's also there's a chat window you can go into chat right from the wallet itself and um some some of the features aren't quite ready yet but um there's there's uh infrastructure in place where it'll allow you to connect directly with facebook and twitter and such from within the wallet uh, helping Redcoin become more of a social currency. Right. Uh, from what I understand, for reading the Coin Brief article, um, uh, this is like a revolutionary new wallet. Because, um, um, like you said, it, it, nothing like this has ever been done before. 
and um, it basically turns your wallet into a social network, right? Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, that's the intention, yes. Um, well, as of right now, it's not actually, uh, you can't actually connect to, um, you know, uh, Facebook and such right now, uh, as far as I can tell. Uh, those that, those features aren't fully activated yet, um, but if if that does happen, it might be revolutionary. Uh, I, I'm not sure like how how it would work. Like if you send someone some red coin through the through the red wallet, uh, and then you can post directly to Facebook that you sent them the coin. Because there's already there's Bitcoin wallets that can do that. You can start. You can send a transaction, and uh, you know, post to Facebook or Twitter or whatever. I just received, uh, you know, 0.5 Bitcoin, or I just sent I sent Bitcoin to someone, and you can post that to social networks. So I'm curious to see how Red Wallet um, implements this idea, and whether it's um, uh, whether you can actually send money to people who don't necessarily have the like wallet installed you know like maybe it'll it'll post to their facebook wall and say i sent you a thousand red coin and then uh, like maybe they just they, it's already in an address for them and then if they I want mean, to they can like they install get a, the wallet. they get a prompt to like download a facebook app or something yeah 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 because yeah. aren't they isn't red coin working on facebook integration yeah to where you can tip people on facebook Mm -hmm. so uh, like well so that's what i imagine it being like if you if you send somebody some red coin on facebook and you know they don't know what it is they'll get a notification saying you know you, your friend sent you red coin and then it'll give you a prompt to download the facebook tipping app so you can claim it and then um and then you know the tipping app will, will prompt you to download the wallet and then um and then all of yeah. a sudden you're involved in the red coin community. Yeah. Um, yeah. But my, I have a question. I've, I've done a little, I've read a little bit about red coin. I understand it's supposed to be like a so the social currency is how they market it. Yeah. But is is red coin supposed to be like a Bitcoin competitor? Or is it just supposed to facilitate social networking? Like is it really is the goal really to have it get any like significant um monetary value yeah i mean well i can only speak from from my opinion i i'm not involved uh with the red coin developers in any way i'm not even really involved in the community that much but um we do have some viewers who are into red coin so so um you know, maybe they can comment uh, below on the video or comment on CoinBrief um, uh, about their opinions about Red Coin's intentions and goals and such. But uh, I don't know about uh, I don't know if they want to be a direct competitor to Bitcoin. It seems to me, based on uh, their marketing and such, that they really just want to position it as the social version of Bitcoin. They want to p make it the um, the go-to currency for doing social tipping and stuff like that, because you know that's still an area where, where Bitcoin is making um, inroads and improvements and stuff. And I guess maybe the Redcoin guys are hoping that they saturate that market faster than Bitcoin can. So yeah, I think it's I think it's mainly intended to be um, just a social currency uh, for social tipping and such. Right. Well, see, my thing about that is um, that's a great way to make social networking more fun. Um, mm. Like, I think I think Dogecoin has done a really great job of making uh, Reddit way more fun, it, especially mm. especially if you go in the actual Dogecoin subreddit because they're just tipping each other constantly, mm. and it's just really hilarious just to be in there. <laughs> but because of all the money flying around. <laughs> yeah, but I mean. I, and I got tipped some Doge once, and I was like, "Ooh, money!" But then I looked at the exchange rate, and it was like a, you know, what I got tipped was like a fraction of a penny, so I didn't even care about it. Yeah. So that's so that's my thing with it. If if Redcoin doesn't really get any significant monetary value, then I just don't really understand the point of it besides making social networking more fun. Uh, yeah, I mean. 
the hopefully the price increases for red coin because um like right now you need like hundreds of thousands of red coin to have what just uh just 20 bucks or something so like i like ideally if you're going to have a cryptocurrency where people tip each other on on social media a lot uh tipping each other on reddit twitter uh facebook and such um you want to have it so that you can you know send someone like five coins and that's equal to like 50 cents or something you know what if one coin was worth uh 10 cents and i think that the uh the red coin devs are kind of hoping that's what happens like they're anticipating that the price goes up it gets more valuable and then eventually you'll be able to tip someone like a hundred red coin and it'll be like it'll be a couple bucks or something uh but yeah they're they're not quite there yet and um I'm not I'm not sure if they'll be able to be more successful uh, with social media than Bitcoin already is. Uh you've got a bunch of different tipping apps that are coming out. Uh people who are making it easier to tip Bitcoin on social media. And I'm you know I'm not sure if Redcoin is going to be able to uh do something that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies just can't do. You know that's 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 what makes cryptocurrency successful is doing something that bitcoin can't do yeah well i mean what i think about bitcoin tipping is that um i think i think dogecoin has been so much more successful in terms of tipping than bitcoin has been and i think redcoin could be just as successful as dogecoin because no, nobody really wants to give up their Bitcoin because it's so valuable now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, so that kind of that kind of seems like a problem to me. But again, I don't, I don't really know anything about tipping. I'm more concerned with you know, with the economics of Bitcoin, yeah, the macro so, stuff, right? So, um, but it, it seems like you know, if it's too if it's too valuable, nobody's gonna want to tip with it. Because they they're not gonna want to give it up. They're gonna want to you know buy something with yeah, it. Yeah, that's that's but, a psychological um, aspect. But if it if it's not valuable enough, uh, then people really won't have any interest in dealing with it because you know you'll 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 get some some red coin and you'll find out how much it's worth and you won't really care about it because you know it's like it's like two cents or something. Uh -huh. Um. So yeah, I like I like what you said. Like if it can be if it it's like, if it's like worth ten cents or something, uh. And somebody and somebody gives you a couple, and you end up having like five bucks. Yeah, you know that can, you know that that can like buy a couple songs, or uh, yeah, you know maybe you can maybe you can put it on like a prepaid card or something, like go to Starbucks or something. Um, so I think if so, I think if that's what happens, it would really make a social networking much more valuable to convey ideas because people would be more uh i think people would uh be more concerned with providing valuable content on their social networking sites yeah I, that's the uh, goal because, right to to yeah. incentivize people to make good content yeah because um you know right now if, i i mean i really hate facebook right now and i don't really pay much attention to it anymore yeah. Just because the, the things that are posted on there are so meaningless, you know, except for some of the news pages I follow. Mm. So, um, yeah, like you said. If, <laughs> Maybe if, if we incentivize can... people to make better content on Facebook. Yeah, exactly. You know, like you said, yeah. if if Redcoin gets up to like 10 or 15 cents per coin and uh, they can get – and the development team can integrate it into Facebook and Twitter – They've already got it in Twitter. Uh, they have a good tipping bot, I think. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. if they can get it into yeah. Facebook, you know, and people can actually, you know, make some pocket money to get songs, maybe even pay for a Netflix subscription or something. Yeah. You know, though, if if they know that they can do that, they can uh, get you know some small luxuries like that from providing quality content. I think that would make social networking. Uh, a much more valuable experience than it is right now. Yeah, yeah, that would be fantastic. And you know, if 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 that's Redcoin's uh, ultimate goal, 
more power to them. I fully support them. I want to see uh, cryptocurrency tipping integrated more deeply into every social network. I want to be able to uh, read someone's status on Facebook or read someone's tweet on Twitter or read someone's self-post on Reddit and just be able to click like one little button that would be like, you know, plus, plus one, um, give me uh, like plus 100 Dogecoin or yeah. plus 1000 red coin or something just click it and then boom like like instantly like uh, my money is in their pocket now and you know thanks for the great content uh please post more content in the future you know uh, reward that person so yeah, yeah i be, i want to see that happen that would be really great for social media um especially especially if uh if bitcoin if if uh, you can tip really well with Bitcoin, you know, like like I said, people don't want to let go of it because it's too valuable. Um, but if people were willing to, you know, it's it's so much more valuable than the other ones that uh, that it would make it that much better. Yeah. Like I saw a few weeks ago that YouTube was considering uh, or or like working on adding um, a Bitcoin tip button to the yeah. to the video page. And so I thought that was really interesting because my immediate thought was for for YouTubers that did music, you know, essentially it would become yeah. like an online version of the street busker, and you know you like you toss a dollar bill in, the, in their yeah. hat. Yeah. Now you know you click you click the tip button and you get a you give them like a dollar worth of Bitcoin, um, or red coin, and uh, and that would encourage them to make more content. Yeah. Yeah. YouTube. Oh perfect example like it was so many people makes tons of great content but in most cases they do it for free like they do it because they love it and you know if 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 cryptocurrencies can provide a better way for their audience to support them um then fantastic i i i hope it happens yeah i i think it's pretty exciting i'm looking forward to it yeah Okay, well, um, we've uh, we've covered a lot of topics today, and um, that'll be about it for the uh, fifth episode of the Coin Brief podcast. I'm Sean Wentz. I'm Evan Faggart. And um, we'll uh, see you guys next week uh, with a new discussion, um, uh, probably centering uh, mostly on the U.S. Marshals auction and how that all plays out. So. Um, Happy tipping, everyone, and uh, we'll uh, see you next week.